Hello and welcome to Beverly Baptist Church. For those who don't know me, my name is Phil and I'll be leading this act of worship today. Over the next hour or so, we're going to have some songs, which you're welcome to join in with or just to listen as you wish. We will pray together, we will read from the Bible and we will think a little about what it has to say for us today. There will also be an opportunity to share bread and wine together in communion. So if you wish to take part in that meal and you haven't already, please do find suitable food and drink so that you can join us in remembering Jesus' death. Communion will be coming a little later than sometimes in our service today. We'll be putting it as a, a response to our consideration of the Bible and our talk. I know some of you who are watching as a family with children perhaps don't always watch all the way through the service and so I will give you an indication a little later on as to what sort of time communion will happen so that you can plan accordingly. It's the start of a new academic year and as usual on this Sunday we will be celebrating our children and our young people as part of this service. Praying for them and for our Sunday school at the start of a new academic year. Let's focus our hearts and our minds on Jesus as we come to worship. John writes this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Let us worship together the eternal word who became flesh for us in Jesus and pray that as we do so, we might see his glory. Phil and Julie are going to lead us in sung worship. You were the word at the beginning, from with God the Lord knows high. In glory and creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Lord God, we worship you this morning as our God and our King. We exalt you as the one who rules and reigns over all that you have made. You called the universe into being and ever since you have been watching over it in love. We declare that you are still in control even when all around us seems to crumble and fade. Forgive us when we doubt your power or your love. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning as the one who showed how power should be used. We praise you for your willingness to give up the power and the glory which you had in order to come to live on this earth. We thank you for your love and grace, which took you even to the cross, so that we might be forgiven and cleansed from all that is wrong within us, and might enter into a loving relationship with you. 
Holy Spirit, we thank you for your ongoing presence with us, assuring us of that love, giving us your divine power, and teaching us to use it in accordance with the example of Jesus, of humility and love. Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we praise and worship you this morning as King of the Universe. Cleanse from us all that is wrong within us and come and take your rightful place again as King of our lives and of our community. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, the name which is above every name. Amen. To my knowledge, there are no major notices this morning. But a continual reminder to keep in touch with one another. And particularly if you have any pastoral concerns, do let a member of the leadership team know so that we can support you appropriately in practical ways as well as praying for you and with you. Next week, we will be starting a new series of sermons looking at prayer hoping to address some of the things that keep us from praying effectively and to practically help us all to develop our prayer lives. And alongside that, there's going to be a number of ways in which we're going to be encouraging one another in prayer, particularly when it comes to praying outwards for those who do not yet know Jesus and who we would love to come into a relationship with him. And so during our services over the next couple of months, we'll be introducing some suggestions as to how we might grow our life of prayer together. Our crunchy fairies are still hard at work, delivering chocolate to those who are celebrating. Please do let us know of your causes for celebration so we can get those chocolate bars to you. They've been particularly busy these past couple of weeks delivering crunchy, bar, crunchy bars to all our children and our young people as they are going back to school. Uh, and we do thank the Crunchy Fairies for their efforts in that. Because it is one of the great things about our church family here at BBC that we have so many families and children among us. And if I can say something to you, the children watching at this moment, because I want you to hear this, I've been talking to people in our church over the past few months and many things have been mentioned about what people are missing while we can't meet together in our usual way. But the thing that people have said to me more than anything else is how much they miss seeing all our children and young people. They miss your energy, your enthusiasm, your worship, they miss seeing what you're learning together. They miss learning from you. You are valued very much. And we are all looking forward to the time when we can meet together again. And on this first Sunday of the new academic year, we would normally get you all up the front to pray for you and also pray for your Sunday school teachers as we start the new year. Well, we obviously can't do that. But we do have some videos and pictures which have been sent in from our children and young people. Telling us a little bit about what they've been up to and about how we can pray for them at this time. <laughs>
Hi, Benjamin. What have you done this holiday? Zoo. You went to the zoo. Was it really good? What did you do at the zoo? What did you see? And what was the best animal you saw? Snake. Snake. Wow. And what are you doing this week? Where are you going? Where are you going this week? Get to school. What would you like people to pray for you about at school? Just, You're a bit nervous. What are you nervous about? Just, what are you nervous about at school? Doing next this week. Uh, pasta. Nursery. Are you excited? Benjamin's going to school, isn't he? He's not not at nursery anymore. You're gonna miss him. Yeah, you're gonna have a good time there. A good time. Would you like people to pray for you at nursery? Yeah. Say thank you. Some of the things I've enjoyed doing this summer have been looking after ducks, baking seeing Twiglets online and in person um, and seeing other friends. Also my secondary school put on some activities for us to do in the summer and they were really fun to do as well. So even though my, sec uh, my summer hasn't been as normal as it would have been without Covid, uh, it, it's still been really fun. A definite thing that I've missed um, has been going to church. Uh, I enjoy going actually to church and being with the people, um, but I still like the fact that we can do it online um, and see each other after that on Zoom. The thing to pray for, um, it would be really helpful for school, um, because we don't have to social distance with children, uh, we'd have to social distance, we have to wear masks some pla in some places, but it'd be really helpful if you could pray that school makes the right decisions um, that are best for children and staff. Uh, I know this isn't about me, but it would still be also be good if you could pray for my grandparents, they're going back to Spain, and um, I, pray, I would like to pray that they have a safe journey there, uh, and that they would keep themselves safe as well as other people. Hello. Hello. I hope you're all well. Um, over the lockdown period and the summer holidays, me and Sophie have both been involved in groups run by the church. Um, so what have you been up to? I've been like um, going to Twiglets mm -hmm. and we've been like having picnics. Well, we just had one picnic, but we hope to have more soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've been involved in TAT and we met on Zoom. And we had a picnic as well. Um, also, Abby from India was joining us, which was really good. Um, and it was just nice to catch up with other Christians each week um, during a difficult time. Um, so we hope you're all well, and hopefully we'll see you soon at a church service. Bye. Bye. Also, as part of this service each year, we present Bibles to children who are moving up in age. We've altered how we do our Sunday school groups, so it doesn't always mean moving to a new cohort of children anymore. And obviously the groups are suspended at the moment anyway. Uh, but Karen has kindly looked at the list for me, and there are some children this year who are due uh, new Bibles. And so there will be one of these uh, for Elizabeth. A new one. This is uh, one of my boys. A nice shiny new one for Elizabeth. There will be one of these for each of Eliza and Chloe and Sarah. And there will also be new Bibles, possibly this one. Depends how many we've got left in the office because they don't seem to be printing this anymore. Uh, but there will be new appropriately aged Bibles for Katie, Grace, Lydia, Sophie, Abigail, Emma, James, Johanna and Luke. Big group, big cohort there. We will get those to you. It might be a little while because we're not yet back into the church office because of building work going on in the building. So we'll have to get in and get the Bibles and get them delivered to you. 
but they will be on their way as soon as we can. Let's pray for all of our children and young people. Lord, we thank you for our families and children. We thank you for all that they bring to our church community. We thank you that they are part of us, your family, loved by you. And at the start of this new academic year, we pray for them. We pray for them in their schools as they settle into new classes and routines, that they will adjust quickly to any changes and will have fun and learn well. And we pray particularly for those who are starting new schools, that they would quickly feel at home and find good friends. We pray for our children also in their learning about you. Uh, we would normally pray for Sunday school teachers. This year parents are having to step into that role and we thank you for their willingness to help their children learn. We pray for wisdom and patience and the ability to communicate faith clearly. And we ask that our children will see faith in their parents. Sometimes it's harder to see what you are doing in people we spend the most time with. But will you shine through for our young people? We pray for those who are receiving new Bibles, that they will read them, and you will shine through the pages into young hearts. And we pray for each one of our young people that you will lead them to faith in Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in this ever-changing world, we pray for those who are still struggling with not being able to do all the hobbies and extracurricular activities that they enjoy so much, that you would give them patience, and that we will soon be able to take further steps towards normality. And we ask that we will be able to find opportunities for our children to be able to gather together, to spend time with one another, to encourage each other in their faith, and to learn together about you, and to pray for one another. Bless our children, our teenagers, our parents and our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I said I'd give an update on timings for communion. And so for those who might find it helpful, we will be moving into a time of communion about 25 minutes from now. If you're watching this live, obviously if you're catching up at a later time, you can fast forward and pause as you wish. So let's read the Bible together. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 2. Well-known passage for many of us, I'm sure. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, picks up on many themes that we've already referenced during our service this morning. Paul writes this to the church at Philippi. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus 
every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we thank you for those great words, for the vision of Jesus which they reveal to us. As we seek to understand now what that means for us today, speak by your Holy Spirit, we pray, to each of our hearts, that we might be transformed more and more into your likeness. Amen. If I were to ask you to recite from memory your 10 favourite Bible passages, not verses, passages, I wonder how you'd do. If I were to ask you to recite the words from your 10 favourite hymns and songs, I suspect many of us would do better. There's something about poetry, particularly when set to music, that makes it stick in our memory. It's one reason why music has usually been such a key part of Christian worship. Not only does it enable us to lift our hearts and minds and emotions and to give God praise and glory with all our being, it also embeds within us the truth of the faith, as the words which we sing keep going round in our minds. Ira Sankey wrote the hymns for many of the evangelistic crusades at the turn of the last century. And so many of Sankey's hymns had a chorus with a catchy tune that you would sing four or five times during the course of the hymn. And it would stick with people when the content of the talk had long since passed. Even when Billy Graham came to the UK in the middle of the century. There's stories told of tube trains going home from the Billy Graham Crusades in the evening where the doors opened at the station and you could hear the people on the train singing just as I am, without one plea. If you ask those people what Billy Graham said, could they remember? At least not word for word, but they remembered the song. It's not a new technique. Paul knew of it. He quotes at times from hymns that even in those early days of the church had been written and had become well known. And in our reading this morning, there was one such. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11 is an old hymn. And what a hymn! With its vivid picture language, we're drawn to this amazing vision of Jesus in glory, seated on the heavenly throne with all of creation bowing before him, every tongue confessing his lordship, God having all the glory and praise and honour. It lifts our hearts into the heavenlies, it stirs our souls, it encourages us and uplifts us. It's a vision that's inspired so many hymns and songs throughout 2,000 years. At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Worthy, O Lamb of God, art thou that every knee to thee should bow, and more modern songs, some of which we've sung in our service this morning. But that's actually the end of the hymn, that vision. There's quite a lot to get through before we get to Jesus on the throne with all creation bowing and worshipping. Because this hymn, in just a few short verses, traces the whole of Jesus' existence. It begins in the heavenlies with the eternal Son of God, who is God, God in very nature, equal with God. As we read at the beginning of our service, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Son who participates fully in all that the Godhead has to offer, who lacks nothing, who lives in perfect harmony with the Father and the Spirit in the fullness of triune deity. The Son who played a full part in the councils of eternity, in creating the universe, in bringing life into being, in sustaining it. The Son who has absolutely no reason to ever change anything about his situation. It is perfect. He is perfect. Perfectly complete. 
absolutely no reason save one thing love he loves all that he has made and seeing the mess into which this world has fallen its desperate need of redemption of cleansing of forgiveness of a new start he lays aside all that is to his advantage all the glory of the godhead all his status he counts it as nothing and he makes himself nothing by taking in its place a human nature with all the frailty and uncertainty and incompleteness and lack of status that that brings with it but there's more it's too small a thing just to become human, to live, to experience life, to identify with our humanity. Love takes him further to even deeper levels of humility. The one who laid aside the glory of the heavenlies to live as a man on earth now lays aside even that human life and offers himself to suffer and to die. And not just any death. The full horror of what is still probably the most inhumane method of execution ever designed. Crucifixion. What a journey. From the highest of heights to the depths of the grave. Humbling himself in a way that, that redefines humility. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendour, all for love's sake becamest poor and then we get to verse 9 therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name because of all that has gone before yes Jesus is now at the highest place the name above every name exalted in the heavenlies sat at the right hand of God but that's because and only because he was willing to humble himself and walk the way of the cross we can't get to that wonderful vision at the end of the hymn without what's gone before. We can't get to where we are now without where we have been. We can't get to the exalted Jesus without the suffering Jesus. We can't get to Jesus the King without Jesus the Servant. But because Jesus was willing to humble himself, even humiliate himself for our sake, so God has exalted him and given him a new name. Higher than all names, a name at which every knee is called to bow in worship. In God's mysterious economy, the one who had everything, because he was willing to give it up, gains even more. Jesus, who was already God with all the perfection that that entails, having taken on a human body, suffered, died, risen again, gains even greater exaltation and glory because he's not now just God and Lord, he is Saviour. He is Redeemer of humanity and indeed all of creation. And so rightly, all must bow in worship. All must acknowledge him as Lord. All must give him honour and praise which he is due as the one who has loved us and saved us. And I hope and pray you can give a hearty Amen to that, that it lifts your heart in thanks and praise to Jesus for what he has done. But there's a sting in the tail, or even in the head. Because how does Paul preface his use of this great hymn? Verse 5 of Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Everything in this hymn, all that we have talked about, is not just to show us how great Jesus' love is for us, though it does. It's not just to stir us to deeper love for him, though it should. And it's not just to live us to greater, lift us to greater praise and worship, though it surely must. But it's also, says Paul, to show you how you must be. Jesus is not just our example. And Christian traditions that have reduced him to a great moral teacher who we should copy have done him a great disservice. 
But we risk doing a similar disservice in our evangelical culture if we place so much emphasis on Jesus as divine, on his atoning sacrifice on the cross, on his reign in glory, that we lose sight of the fact that he is also our example of perfect humanity. And so his path to glory is also our path to glory. And we want the glory, don't we? We look at the vision in this hymn or, or the even greater detail that's given in the book of Revelation of, of Jesus on the throne and new heavens and new earth, no more death and crying and mourning and pain, every tear wiped from our eyes, a place where there's nothing evil, all is good, all is light, all is glory, the presence of Jesus forever before his throne, worshipping him, the fullness of all that we were meant to be and all this going on and on and on for eternity. And we see that vision and our hearts stir within us. We want that. We know that's what we were made for. We cry out with the writer of that vision of Revelation. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. And it's ours as we're in Jesus. It's our hope. It's our destiny. It's our glory. But the road to that glory is the way of the cross. The way of humility. The way of suffering. Not that our lives will completely mirror his. We're not first century Jews. We're not going to be crucified. We're not called to be the saviour of the world. But our attitude, our mindset, our inner approach is to mirror his. That way of life characterised by humility, by love, by serving others rather than our own interests. That's the context in which Paul is setting this in the first four verses of this chapter. And he's saying to these Philippian Christians, Jesus is the example, the ultimate example of what this looks like. And so we, like him, need to be willing to lose our grasp on what we have, on our current status. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I sometimes remind myself there's a sense in which I'm the least important person in our church. Because ultimately my calling in being in this place is to serve the church community. And the well-being of that community and its members is higher than my own desires. And at times, and I felt that this year actually if I'm honest, that's a struggle. Knowing what I would do but having to think about, is that what's the right thing for the church community as a whole? And though any of us who hold any status in the church need to be wary of using it to our advantage as a tool of power, as a means to get what we want. And that's not just church leaders. For many years, I was a church organist. I'm sure you know the difference between an organist and a terrorist. You can negotiate with a terrorist. Sadly, there are some musicians who use their gifting, particularly if there's nobody else, to hold churches to ransom. And it can be other roles in the church too, or sometimes not roles particularly, simply the length of time we've been here, the amount of money we give. It can give us, in our eyes or the eyes of others, more importance. What we say means more, matters more. But no, says Paul, give it up. Count it as nothing. Take the nature of a servant. Look to the interests of others and to the community as a whole and its future. To God's call on its future. Rather than to your own wants and desires. Because ultimately the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And Paul's writing in the context of relationships within the church, but I think there's also something to say to us about how we relate to those outside the church. Because Christians can sometimes come across as considering ourselves somehow better than others. Like we have a hotline to the Almighty. And yes, by the power of the Spirit and through the Scriptures, we do have the mind of Christ, collectively. But even this is not something to be grasped. 
not to be used for our own advantage, but in the service of those who do not yet have it. Like Jesus, inhabiting the experience of others, becoming incarnate with them in their frailty, even being willing to suffer alongside them and die with them, because we regard them more highly than ourselves. It's not the easy path, but Jesus never said it would be easy. In fact, he said, take up your cross. And we sometimes misquote. We say, take up your cross and follow me. Well, there's a key word in the middle there. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. This isn't a once off. This is a daily recommitment to the way of the cross, to the way of suffering, of humility, of putting others ahead of ourselves, of doing everything for their sake rather than our own. It's not the easy path, but it is the path to glory. Because as Jesus, through his humility, his suffering and his death, is exalted to the highest place, so in our humility and service we too are exalted. Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 11 to 12, probably quoting another hymn or poem. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. As Jesus sits on the throne, exalted in the glory at the right hand of the Father for all eternity, we bow before him and confess his lordship, his glory, his rightful place as the king of the universe. And so we are lifted into his presence and we share in his glory. Romans 8 verse 17. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. So what are you going to do in response to this? As you've heard again the words of this great hymn, as we've considered them together, how has it made you feel? Has it stirred your heart and your soul? Jesus is right now at this moment exalted in the highest place he is lord of all because what because of what he has done for you in humbling himself to the obedience of the cross and one day you will each and every one bow the knee in adoration before him and acknowledge him as God and Lord and Saviour, and give glory to God for all that he is and all that he has done. The question is not whether you will do that, but whether you will do so willingly or reluctantly. Will you right here, right now, bow before him and say that he is not just the Lord, but your Lord? your saviour will you acknowledge he has done all this for you will you exalt him in your hearts to his rightful place as lord and king and if you will then know what it is that you are doing and saying because to do so is not the fast track path to glory acknowledging jesus willingly here and now is not the way to exaltation and status in this life Rather, it is a commitment to humble yourself, to take up your cross, to be obedient to his call, even if it leads to suffering and death. It means looking to the needs of others, putting the community of the church and individuals within that community and indeed the wider world ahead of yourself. Bowing before Jesus means recognising his supreme status and in so doing giving up any status you may have or may think you have or may wish you had. It's about recognising that you cannot exalt yourself. But in that humbling, God meets you in Jesus. As you humble yourself at the foot of the cross, where Jesus in humility offers himself to die for you. As you confess there your need of him, 
that he did die for you. Then he will take you and exalt you, lift you up, not because of anything in yourself, but because of his great love for you. Lifting you from the depths of humility and denial of self to the heights of his glorious presence. The majestic presence in which we will all one day bow the knee before the Lamb seated on the throne. And will join in that eternal song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're going to move now into a time of communion. Remembering what we've just spoken about. The one who is the name above all names, but who humbled himself to the cross to serve us, to save us. And who calls us now to acknowledge him as Lord and to humbly serve one another. As we come to the table of the Lord, we're going to sing of our servant king. Oh, 
Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to do everything that was necessary for our salvation. Help us not to underestimate what that meant. For the one who brought the universe into being, to humble himself into human form and to go to the agony of the cross. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget how much it cost for us to be able to sit in this place knowing that we are safe in you. We can say that so easily. But what you had to do to bring us to this place was so far from easy. We thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your humility. And we praise you and exalt you and lift you up as the name that truly is above every name. The name that is worthy of all honour and glory and praise. For you have won for yourself a people. Your people. A people loved by you. A people who will spend eternity in your presence. And so as we come to take bread and wine together in just a foretaste of that presence, may we know you real to us here and now in this meal. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's proclaim the Lord's death together as we share in this meal. the body of Jesus, given, broken, for you. blood of Jesus poured out that you might be healed and forgiven. Drink with thanksgiving.
thank you loving God that in this place we can know that you forgive us that in this place as we come and bow before your cross you lift us up and you exalt us into your presence to worship you for all eternity. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Thank you to everyone who has been involved in making this service happen. Thank you to Julie and Phil for the music and Phil has also edited this week's video. Been a busy man. Thank you to all our children and young people for enhancing our worship and to each one of you who has shared with us particularly as we have taken communion together. I pray that God has blessed you during this time. And now to, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father.
to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen.